Good morning. Welcome to the London United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah French. I'm the music director here. If you're visiting with us, we want to welcome you, and uh, we're so glad that you've chosen us today to worship. A um, couple of announcements. Attendance pads will move from the back to the front. If you're visiting with us, we'd love to get contact information from you so you can reach out and share what's going on here at our church. Um, and once you get to the front row, just leave it on the front row, and we'll pick up the next one. Today is a special Sunday. It is United Women in Faith Sunday. We have several Bologna United Women um, in Faith members that will be leading us in worship today. And we're excited to have our guest speaker, Sharmal Roussel. Did I say that? Is that Okay. Um, she's with us, and she'll be uh, speaking in just a little bit. Dean will be introducing her shortly. We're going to join together in worship. This is the day. Now that we're all awake after this rainy morning, if you'll please stand and join us in singing in the garden. That's hymn number 314. We'll do all three verses.
be seated. If the children would come forward, we have a special message for you this day. This is our hour. It is. Good morning, everybody. Are there some more children out there? Oh, and here comes the cloud. I'm so excited. Okay, I appreciate that. I need all the help I can get up here, y'all. What is that? What is that? Earth. How do you know? Where did it come from? It is a planet. It came from God. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited that somebody said that. I'll be so glad when I know your name. And maybe some of you will even know mine. I'm Miss Brazier, or you can call me Miss Dinah. Can you remember that? That would be good. Okay. You know, there's a song that goes along with this. It goes along with this. Um, let me sing it for you and see if you all can catch on to it pretty fast. You may already know it. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Now, this young man here is not God, and he's got the world in his hands right now. And we know he's not God, but you know what? He is a representative of God. And in Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, it just says right in there that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Before anything else was ever here, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God, I guess he got kind of bored looking out, and all he could see was something that looked like a bunch of duck soup. Or gumbo. That's all he could see. So he decided he wanted to do something about it. And so he didn't even have to work hard at it. All he had to do was think it. And it, and earth was created. Everything was created. Um, the solar system, you kids probably know more about it than I do. It was all created. And earth was the cream of the crop. It was the only place where people people could exist, could live. And we're still here, and that's been, I don't know, thousands and millions of years ago. People say, oh, what, that long? Well, I like this one verse that says, one day is with the Lord like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like one day. 
Now that's amazing, and it makes a whole lot of sense about all of our beliefs that we have. Um, the thing is, God created the heavens and the earth, and but Jesus, when he came to earth, Jesus was, who was Jesus in relation to God? Who? Was he, was he God's brother? Was he God's, God's son? Okay. So, Jesus was God's son. But he wanted us to know something important. And by the way, this is good because this is Father's Day. And God was Jesus' father. But Jesus wanted all of us to know. And he had disciples around here, around him, just like I have children and moms. He wanted the disciples to know that God is not just my father. He's your father, too. And we have proof of that in the Bible. And Jesus was sitting around with his disciples, and he said, God knows what you know, what you need before you even ask him. And then he taught his disciples, and it was men and women who went around and helped Jesus and followed Jesus in his ministry. He wanted them to know that God is your father too. And so he taught them a special prayer. And it's a special prayer that points out that God is everybody, is all our father. He's our father. And Hey, man, that makes it, if Jesus is his son, I guess we're kind of like Jesus' brothers and sisters, too. And so we say this prayer every week in church. Can anybody think of the first words of the Lord's Prayer that we say in church? Anybody? Can some grand, grown person tell, help us with that? Our Father, our Father who is in heaven. And then it says, hallowed be thy name, which means we honor you, God. And so today, as God is our Father, let us honor him through the way we live and through our kindness to others. Let's say a prayer together. Y'all just follow my words. Bow your heads and we'll pray together. Dear God, thank you that you're our Father, that you're our Father who will never leave us and is always with us, even here today. Happy Father's Day to you, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us in singing, How Great Is Our God? The words will be on the screen. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. And time. Beginning and the end. 
You may be seated. Join me when the call to worship comes in your bulletin and on the screen. United Women in Faith is a community of women who seek to connect and nurture women through Christian spiritual formation, leadership development, creative fellowship, and education so that they can inspire, influence, and impact local and global communities. God, you gather your believers to seek and follow your will. United Women in Faith is a powerful, fearless force driven by God's love and united in sisterhood. God, you call all of us to live as a community, loving and encouraging one another. United Women in Faith is focused on women, children, and youth, and acts for justice and transforms communities. God, you plead for us to engage with our sisters and brothers around the world, seeking justice and peace. Let us celebrate the mission of the United Women in Faith and the mission of our global church. May we take this mission beyond our church walls and into the community where we are called to be disciples and good neighbors. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 24, verses 1 through 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and he established it on the water. The second scripture reading comes from James 2, verses 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of the word. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Charmel Roussel as our guest speaker. Charmel represents Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light, whose mission is to educate and energize diverse faith communities, to care for God's creation, and to work toward climate justice. Charmel is a Christian environmentalist, a grandmother, a daughter, and a fine lady. <laughs> Welcome, Charmel. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker Roussel. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you all so much for inviting me to come and join you today. I'm so uh, happy to be here. And uh, for I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light is, because you've probably never heard of that. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, plastic and styrofoam, and then we're going to talk a little bit about energy efficiency. So uh, Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light is a statewide organization. Interfaith Power and Light is a national organization, and the people in the congregations who belong to it all believe that the sacred writings of all faith traditions 
asks us to care for creation, protect the planet, and preserve fragile ecosystems that sustain life. So you hear that word interfaith in there. And so it's not just Christians of all different varieties. It's also Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and a lot of different faith traditions. So when I go to national conferences, I see a lot of nuns and a lot of rabbis and a lot of people, you know, of all different religious persuasions who all have this common belief. Like we heard in the children's uh, lesson this morning, God, the creator God, created everything that we see on our planet. First, God created the heavens and the earth and all the animals and the plants. And what did God create last? I know you can talk because I heard you earlier. What was the last thing that God created? Mankind. Mankind was created last. That's right. And God asked mankind to take care of the garden, to take care of creation. So uh, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, before we get into some of the specifics, that I've talked about an Old Testament uh, story, but I want to move ahead to a, a New Testament parable that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and that is the story of the good Samaritan. So if you'll remember, um, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a man is uh, hurt. Uh, actually, he's badly hurt, and he's lying by the side of the road. Uh, obviously, this is a problem that needs some attention. And three people come by. Who was the first person to come by in the, in the parable? I already heard you speak up. Who was the first person that came by? Anybody know? It was a rabbi. It was a religious leader in the community. Okay, every time somebody gets an answer right, I'm going to uh, hand out these little uh, booklets called 30 Simple Things You Can Do to Save Energy and Money. Every time you get an answer right, I'm going to put one right up here. Probably shouldn't put it on the altar. I'm going to put it right over here, and you can come and get these later. How does that sound? All right, so the first person to come by was a rabbi, a religious leader in the community. Did the rabbi do anything about the problem? No, the rabbi did not. Who was the second person to come by? Anybody remember? A Pharisee or a Levite? That's right. It, here, I'm going to put another book over here. That was a little close. A Pharisee or a Levite. So a Levite would have been a leader in the community, a person, uh, a fine, upstanding person in the community. Maybe he belonged to the Rotary Club or he was on the City Beautiful Commission. We don't know exactly, but we know that he was a respected man in the community. And did the Levite do anything about this problem that he saw? No, he did not. He might have averted his eyes, crossed to the other side of the road, and thought to himself, you know, I see that there's a problem here, and somebody ought to do something about this problem, but I'm just too busy. So i got to be on my way, and I hope somebody does something about this problem. So who was the third person who came by? The Samaritan was the third person who came by. Now, a, th a Samaritan would have been a person of low standing in the community. In fact, the Jews called the Samaritans um, uh, undesirable. They were people who had no status. A, the Samaritan was a nobody, but it was a nobody who used his own time and resources to take care of the man who was hurt by the side of the road. That is taking action, like we heard in our second scripture today. Uh, putting faith into action. It was a Samaritan who saw a problem and did something about it. And it, sometimes it takes nobodies, people like you and me, to do something about problems that we see in our society. So I'm going to read to you a little bit uh, from uh, a book that uh, I really like by uh, Dr. J. Matthew Sleuth called uh, Serve God, Save the Planet. But before I do that, I want to tell you that um, when it comes to environmental uh, problems in our, uh, in our communities and in our world, we are all complicit. Nobody is blameless. I did not ride my bicycle here today. And when I go home, 
after I do my laundry, I will not put my laundry out on a clothesline outside, which would be the most environmentally friendly thing to do. So we're all part of the problem, but there are all things that we can do. There are personal choices that we can make, and there are choices that we can make as congregations that will lead us down this path of uh, taking care of God's good and perfect creation. So, Dr. J. Matthew Sleuth is somebody that I've met a couple of times, once in Little Rock and once in Washington, D.C. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is an emergency room physician up on the East Coast doing really, really well. He and his family lived in a gorgeous home on the beach. It was so picturesque that Land's End Catalog did their photo shoots on the beach in front of his house. But while he was an emergency room physician, he started noticing people coming into the emergency room over and over again with some of the same problems and conditions. And they were respiratory illnesses, and a lot of them were children with asthma. So he started looking around at what was going on in our world and in our environment that was contributing to this. And uh, he connected the dots between pollution in the air and people's respiratory illnesses and asthma in children. Now, to make a long story short, Matthew Sleeth quit practicing medicine, and he has devoted his life to increasing the awareness about what is going on in our environment and what is happening to our planet and what is happening to people's health. Now, Matthew Sleeth is not a Methodist like you. He's not a Presbyterian like me. Matthew Sleeth is an evangelical, so he has a very... Um, a, a very conservative perspective on religious issues. But he quit practicing medicine. He and his family moved out of their mansion on the beach, and they moved to a home that is the size of their former garage so that they could reduce their impact on the planet. And they unplugged from everything, almost all electronics. You can reach him by email, but I mean they really took this uh, took this problem seriously and decided to change their lives. Now, I've got to put on my reading glasses here, and I'm going to read to you just a little bit from uh, Sleeth's book. We talked about the Good Samaritan story. Here's what J. Matthew Sleeth has to say about that. Love thy neighbor as thyself. One cannot claim to be a Christian and ignore the golden rule. It isn't a suggestion or a guideline. It is a commandment from God. What is the connection between the parable of the Good Samaritan, the golden rule, and the environment? Isn't our choice of homes, cars, and appliances just a matter of lifestyle and therefore not a moral or spiritual matter? Does God care whether I drive an SUV, leave the TV on all night, or fly around the world to go on a snow skiing vacation. The Bible doesn't mention any of these things. Then he goes on to say, It is tempting to point to a self-serving lobbyist or a power-hungry elected official and blame him for the 64,000 annual deaths from airborne soot. But what about me? What about us? Remember the light bulb? By changing light bulbs, hanging clothes on the line, taking fewer trips to the mall, carpooling, and earning more modest homes, Christians can save lives. They can save their own grandchildren, and more importantly, the lives of people that they will never meet. He goes on to say, we cannot compare ourselves to people who behave more selfishly than ourselves. If I compare myself to someone whose sole source of transportation is a bicycle, then it's tough to feel smug about the 3,000 pounds of gas I put into the atmosphere driving a hybrid automobile. Compared to a family in a coastal town in Haiti, whose annual income is $540, who eats only two meals a day, and who cannot buy its way out of the effects of global warming. How thoughtful am I? What kind of a neighbor am I? 
the one and a half tons of greenhouse gases my hybrid car produces contribute to the change in sea level and the fish populations on which those people in Haiti depend. Comparing myself to my neighbor is useful, but which neighbor? In the parable of Jesus, the Samaritan compares himself to the mug man. He applies the golden rule, and he is compelled to act. Now, Matthew Sleeth, of course, believes in trying to uh, lessen our carbon footprint on the earth, living a more modest lifestyle, and being and consuming less, all of which impacts the planet. But he goes on to say, on no subject is Jesus more clear than on materialism. A life focused on possessions is a poor and misguided life. Over and over again, Jesus urges us to seek a spiritual path and a life of loving one another. He goes on to say, uh, whenever I am tempted to buy something, I ask myself, will it bring me closer to God? The average person is exposed to 3,000 advertisements a day through radio, TV, newspapers, bus signs, billboards, internet, magazines, store windows, and, and many of us have access to cash or credit. And what will we buy? What is the harm of one more pair of shoes to go with the new dress I bought last week? And what about a purse? After all, the right purse is needed to match the shoes that I bought to match the new dress. Where is God in all this consumer materialism? If you haven't found God at home, will you be more likely to find God at a vacation home? Remember when the disciples and the crowd gathered on the hillside to hear Jesus speak? Remember how before Jesus began to teach, Peter got up and read the good news announcements. Those who had kids that needed to be carpooled to the soccer game were excused. And remember how they announced the tool sale at the superstore? Recall how they said that only a fool wouldn't tear out the Formica countertops in their home and replace them with granite ones or whatever the latest trend is. Remember how they suggested buying pearls and jewelry at a great price, even if you needed to charge them? And afterward, Jesus preached saving and investing in the famous Sermon on the Mount. You don't recall any of this, do you, because it didn't happen. And there's a reason that you don't, because it's about consumerism, which is not the message of Jesus uh, just one more thing from Matthew Sleeth. Um, no church can expect to win a single soul by maintaining mowed grass lawns. But this is not true if those grounds are tilled up and made into community gardens. What better place to share the good news about living water, the good shepherd, or the true that bear fruit than a church garden or an arch orchard where you grow things and share them with other people in the community who may not have access to fresh food. There's another uh, book that I wanted to mention to you, and this is a Methodist book, by the way. It's based on the United Methodist Social Principles. Remember those? And it's called Caring for God's Earth. It's edited by uh, J. Rich Richard Keck. And in here, there is a chapter on paper or plastic. And here's how this chapter starts. Weary from a long day at work, Roger shuffles through the aisles of the grocery store. He tries to make choices that meet his shopping needs and that are environmentally friendly. He chooses a non-aerosol hairspray, toilet tissue and paper towels made from recycled paper, frozen foods with just one layer of packaging, a concentrated laundry detergent because the size of the cardboard box is smaller. Then he pauses at the disposable cup. Should he buy the paper or the styrofoam? One comes from trees and the other from oil. Now that's something uh, that we want to talk a little bit about today, and that's uh, plastic and styrofoam. Uh, in every church 
that I've ever belonged to, including the one I belong to now, every church that I've ever visited, <laughs> plastic and styrofoam in the kitchen were an issue. And it, it makes sense because church people want to be good stewards of the contributions that come into church. And styrofoam is so cheap. It's so hard not to go to Sam's and buy a big thing of styrofoam cups that are wrapped in plastic and to put those in your church kitchen. Now, yesterday, I went to a dollar store, general dollar store. You have two between Conway and here. <laughs> I passed them. These were 10 for a dollar, so they're 10 cents a piece. Now, they had styrofoam cups, and the styrofoam cups were 16 for a dollar. So these are 10 cents a piece. The styrofoam cups are 6 cents a piece. So do you think it might be worth it to pay, pay 4 cents more per cup if styrofoam is so much more damaging to the planet? And let me tell you a little bit about um, styrofoam. Get to my styrofoam card here. Styrofoam is littered more than any other waste product. 30% of our landfills globally are filled with styrofoam that people have disposed of. And it will take those, those styrofoam cups or anything styrofoam 500 years to decompose. That's what scientists and engineers estimate because we ain't had styrofoam for 500 years, so we're not sure. But it is not biodegradable. So pretty much it's going to be there forever. And it leaches harmful chemicals into the soil and into the environment. So some better alternatives for you all to consider at home and at church, uh, which would be pleasing to God, would be paper cups, which are biodegradable, or real cups, like coffee cups that you can bring from home or coffee cups that you can keep at church and wash them out, uh, or plant-based containers, which they do make. They make um, uh, containers that you can put uh, your leftovers in or whatever that are based on potatoes or cornstarch or whatever. There's a website that I want to mention to you called um, goodstartpacking.com where you can find some of these options. I put some up. Uh, handouts on your sheet. Actually, my neighbor Irene is up with me who put some handouts. Most of them are up front, but some of them are about recycling. I went to the uh, World Wide Web to look at your recycling service in Valonia, and I learned some things that you might be interested in, and they're on those handouts for you. Uh, what can be recycled? What cannot be recycled? And one of the things that I, I want to call to your attention when you put your things in your recycling bin, if you recycle, is it a good idea to put them first in a plastic bag before you put them? Okay, somebody said no, and that is the correct answer. They do not want recycled bags at the recycling center. And I'm going to tell you why. Just, just throw it uh, straight into your, um, into your recycling bin if you have one. So I have actually toured the recycling center in Conway, and also the one in Little Rock. And let me tell you what happens with all these plastic bags. They get caught up in the rollers, they stop the equipment, and that slows down the process. Now, granted, there are people who work there who can separate things, but those people get paid by your tax money. So wouldn't it be better if we just did it right in the first place and didn't use any plastic bags, just threw our recycle things straight into the recycle bin, like this one that I'm going to leave with you here today. It's my gift to you. Um, just throw it straight into the recycle bin. Recycle truck comes by and picks it up, and you're good to go. Now, I brought one of these plastic bags because it's thin. So when you go to Sam's or Walmart or Kroger, they're going to have all these plastic bags, you know, two-ply, durable, has the drawstrings, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I might choose that if, like, my entire family and all my neighbors were coming over for the 4th of July. But every week, I just use this thin plastic bag because it's less plastic. And you can get these at Sam's pretty cheap. And for me, and probably for most of you, that's going to be enough for your garbage for the week. Well, maybe you might have to use more than one, but I don't. But And I brought you uh, some of these to leave with you so that you can try it out, so that you can see that less plastic might also work for you. So it's another gift. Um, that I'm going to leave with you to just to try out to see if it makes a difference. 
So what is the problem with plastic? They're in every church, and we have a plastic crisis all across the United States of America. There was an ABC special on uh, less than a month ago. It was May 23rd called The Secret Life of Plastic Recycling. Did anybody see that? It was very discouraging. Very little plastic that we put into our recycle bin is actually recycled. Most of it, most of it is incinerated, which means it's burned. And when it's burned, then those toxic chemicals go into the air. So, you know, I, I'm not saying don't recycle, but I'm saying there's a way that we can reduce the amount of plastic that we're using, starting with thinner plastic bags. National Geographic says that every year, 8 million tons of plastic waste is dumped into our oceans. 8 million tons. That is five garbage bags full for every foot of coastline around the world. That's a lot of plastic going into our oceans. So again, I encourage you to look at the Bologna uh, recycling uh, guidelines. That might uh, help you out. Um, in 2021, the United States of America threw away 51 million tons of plastic waste. Only 5% of it was recycled. That's a generous estimate. The rest of it ended up in our landfills, and our landfills are getting bigger and bigger and taking up more and more space on the earth. Now, how is this possible? I mean, we're all recycling. We're all trying to do, you know, the right thing. We try to recycle paper. We try to recycle plastic. But the truth is very little of it is being recycled. There's a, a place that I, I put this on one of your handouts. There's a little four-minute video called The Story of Plastic, and it talks about actually how plastic is manufactured from fossil fuels, uh, the, all of the manufacturing process, how people use it, and then how they try to recycle it, but where it actually ends up. Now, if you, if, so if you miss the ABC special, you might want to look at that little four-minute video. It's a YouTube video online called The Story of Plastic. And I also want to call your attention to the fact that Plastic Free July is coming up. I put that on one of your handouts. There is a website that you can go to, and you can join that challenge. I've already been there and done that. You can challenge yourself to reduce your plastic use during July, and then at the end of July, you can see how you did, and there's also a pledge that you can take uh, to reduce your plastic use. So what are some alternatives? We've already talked about paper cups. I wanted to also talk to you about um, our landfills these days are filled with these little coffee pods that go in your Keurig coffee maker, you know, because there's, there's plastic there. So our landfills are just becoming all clogged up with those little uh, plastic containers that your coffee comes in. Did you know that you can buy this for 5 to $10 at Kroger's, at Walmart? I don't know about Sam's, but anyway, I have three of these just to make sure I never lose one. <laughs> if I travel, I take one of these. You just put your coffee in it, and then you make your coffee, and then you dump your coffee grounds out. I like to put mine on my garden because my tomatoes like that. And uh, then you wash it out, and it's reusable. So I'm sending less plastic to the landfill, something you might, it's a little inexpensive item that you can pick up. Another thing that we want to uh, consider now, plastic water bottles are recyclable, and they're very cheap. So when you go into the grocery store, they're so cheap, it's kind of hard not to buy them, and they're convenient. But, again, less than 5% of them are actually recycled. Most of them are going to end up in the landfill. The landfills are getting clogged up with those plastic water bottles. So a good alternative, paper cups, but also a reusable water bottle. I know you all have these, but sometimes it just takes, before you walk out the door, i got to remember to get my water bottle so that when I get where I'm going to go, I know I'm going to be thirsty and they're going to have those water bottles there and somebody's going to probably try to give me one for free and I'm going to be thirsty and I'm going to be tempted to take it. But if I remember to take my own water bottle, then, you know, I'll have it with me. And I think that that is something that is uh, pleasing to God. Something else that we can do that's really, really simple this has to do with plastic straws. 
plastic straws are filling up our landfills. It's single-use plastic. You use a plastic straw one time and throw it away. And most of the time when you go to a restaurant, they're not even going to ask you if you want a plastic straw. They're just going to give you one. But you can ask ahead of time. You can say, you know what, I'd like to have water and no plastic straw. Or when they bring you a straw, you can say, I don't need this plastic straw. Why don't you save this for the next person? So that way, you know, people start to get it. You know, people in restaurants start to get it, that we don't really need these plastic straws, do we? By the way, they may, you may have noticed that in my water bottle, I have a steel straw that I can rinse out and use over and over and over again. They make hard plastic ones, too. So there's really no reason for us to use these single-use plastic straws that are polluting our earth. Um, and we could say, you know, that we would rather not uh, have a straw. So refuse the straw is a campaign. Stop the straw is another campaign. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing is uh, I know that when you go to uh, out to, when you go to drive through, they have a lot of styrofoam. Uh, Sonic is one of the biggest offenders. They have the biggest styrofoam cups in the world, and they refuse to change. Now, with consumer pressure, they will change. And let me give you an example of that. McDonald's used to have their hamburgers and their french fries in little styrofoam containers. Do you all remember that? But now they're in cardboard boxes and little paper uh, sleeves. The, the french fries are in the paper sleeves. The hamburgers are in the cardboard containers because consumers demanded it. They said, we don't want all this styrofoam when we go to McDonald's. And so McDonald's, which is a worldwide organization, they changed. So next time you're in McDonald's, you might want to say, thank you for not using styrofoam. I mean, because it makes a difference. And eventually, if we do that enough, and if we go to other places that use styrofoam, if we say, I wonder if we could have a paper cup or a paper bag or something else instead of plastic or styrofoam, they'll start to get the message. Consumers have a lot of power. All right. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about energy efficiency. And that is when we, at home and at church, we reduce the amount of energy that we use and our utility bills go down. Every person I know and every church I know wants to reduce their utility bills. Am I right? All right. So the EPA tells us that in 2021, 27% of our carbon emissions came from transportation. That's buses, trains, cars, planes, driving around. 28% came from generating electricity at power plants. 23% came from industry. That would be plants that manufacture things. 13% came from our buildings, like your home and this church building. And 10% of our toxic greenhouse gas emissions came from our agricultural practices, how we grow food. And a lot of the food that we're growing in America these days is corn and soy that goes to feed pigs and cows. It doesn't go to feed people. It's going to feed pigs and cows because we eat so much more meat than we used to. So wouldn't it be better if we grew things vegetables that were good for us to eat and especially if we had community gardens at our churches and other places in the community where we could grow fresh healthy food better for our bodies better for the planet and we shared them with people who don't have access to that food now since i mentioned the epa i, I want to say something about the epa the clean air act uh, was enacted in the 1970s now who can tell me who signed the Clean Air Act? Which president signed the Clean Air Act? Nixon. That's exactly right. I'm going to put a book right over here for you. I'm leaving all these books here for you all so you can pick them up. So back in the 1970s when the Clean Air Act was enacted, every Democrat and every Republican voted for the Clean Air Act. Every single one of them wanted us to have clean air and clean water. Because it's a bipartisan bill. The, uh, because of the Clean Air Act, the EPA was established and has been protecting our air and water for more than 40 years. 
to the extent that they are able, except when they're pressured not to take care of our clean and, uh, uh, our air and water. I want to also mention to you about uh, electric vehicles, which I know you hear a lot about in the news these days. So um, in the past two years, EVs have tripled. Did you know that? And charging stations across the nation have increased 40%. 23,000 new infrastructure projects related to EVs are already implemented. 23,000 new infrastructure projects are already enacted. That's created a lot of new jobs, but it's not enough. So around the world, there is a race to the top to electrify our uh, economies. Now, China wants to be number one in electrification. But wouldn't it be great if the USA were number one in electrifying our economy so that we're less dependent on fossil fuels? Now, this is possible. I'm not going to say we're going to hit some bumps. We're going to hit some hiccups. But if you think that EVs aren't going to happen, I'm here to tell you that they are going to happen. And the reason that EVs, we're going to switch to an electric vehicle economy is because that's what the trucking companies want. So if the trucking companies want it, we're going to have EV charging stations from Mexico to Canada and from the East Coast to the West Coast. And Walmart, which is headquartered in Arkansas, Walmart has already said that they're going to put EV charging stations at all of their Walmart stores. Did you know that? That's a game changer. Why would Walmart do that? Because Walmart wants people with electric vehicles to stop at Walmart and charge their cars. And what are they going to do while they're charging their cars? They're going to go into Walmart and shop. Now, I'm not saying that that's, you know, the way a Walmart ought to be thinking, but they know that this EV economy is coming, not just in the United States, but around the world. You may not have an EV yet. You may never have one, but they're going to be available to you, and, um, and, and I think it's, it's something that more and more people will have. I have I'm going to leave with you uh, some information about a program called Cool Congregations. And it's a way that your church can work on reducing its carbon footprint and earn some prizes. Now, Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light, if you're interested in reducing your, if you're interested in energy efficiency projects that will help you reduce your utility bills, then we offer incentives, $400 to start with for energy improvements at your house of worship plus the possibility of additional funds for building projects and a chance for a $1,000 challenge award through the Cool Congregations program. And I'm going to leave this uh, here with the people who are decision makers at your church about your energy bills and your uh, energy efficiency projects, things like insulation and, and other ways that you can, uh, uh, other improvements that you can make to con con you know, reduce what you use, and reduce your utility bills in the process. Now, you might think that across the nation it'd be hard to win a, uh, a challenge award, but three churches in Arkansas last year did. They were runners-up. They were First Presbyterian in uh, Conway, Second Presbyterian in Little Rock, and then there was a, uh, a Baptist church in Dumas, Arkansas. That, is that right? I think that's right. Wait a minute. No, Dermont. It was the Tabernacle Baptist Church in D Dermont. They all earned awards, money, a check that just came to them, because of some efforts that they made for recognition for the things that they were doing to um, have less impact on the earth. So I'm going to leave that information uh, with your, the leaders of your church about what Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light offers in terms of incentives. Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light also has helped six Arkansas churches uh, install solar on their rooftops. We didn't pay for all of the solar panels, but we offered a few thousand dollars to help them get started because uh, in the past, people who took solar, put solar panels on their house, and I put it on two houses, they got tax breaks, 30% tax break, but churches don't pay taxes, so they didn't get that tax break. So we tried to soften the blow a little bit by giving them several thousand dollars that they would otherwise get. Now that is changing. 
under the Inflation Reduction Act, there are many provisions in there that have to do with improving the environment, and there will be a way that churches and individuals can get direct payment for making energy efficiency improvements at your buildings, including solar installations. Now, some of the little booklets that I left on some of the few pews that come from the Arkansas Energy Department, they're blue. Wait a minute. Let me show you what they look like. They look like this. And some of them have these slips of paper in here on places that you can go to on the World Wide Web that help you know about these government incentives, direct payments to your churches for making energy efficiency improvements. Go to the, uh, this place at whitehouse.gov and get that information. And there's also the same uh, information that you can get as individual consumers. Now, it's taken a long time since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in 2021 to get to this point where they're even telling us, you know, how we're going to get these direct payments because the IRS is involved. So naturally, the wheels are going to turn slowly. It's taken the IRS a long time to figure out, you know, how they're going to compensate uh, churches and other nonprofit organizations for uh, making improvements. But we're finally getting there. The rollout's going to be slow. There are at least two webinars every week that I get on that are about uh, how this rollout is going to impact houses of worship, how your churches are going to benefit from making energy efficiency improvements. So not only are you going to get a check from the government, your utility bills are going to go down. So um, that's something that I, that I hope that you'll consider. I'm going to leave all this information with you. I'm going to leave this with you in case you have a room that doesn't have a recycle bin that might need a recycle bin. And um, I, I would like for us to close um, with a prayer that comes uh, from your Methodist booklet, uh, Caring for God's Earth. God of all creation, we care about our world. We want to be good stewards of creation. We often feel confused or powerless. Open our minds and hearts to new ideas. Give us a faith. Give us a renewed sense of hope. Show us what we can do each day to care for your earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So, thank you very much. Happy to be here with you. I'm going to leave these uh, booklets and things here for you and take all of my other things. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, let us affirm our faith as it is written in the Old and New Testament. Please stand and join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Lord, Lord on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. share with you our joys and concerns for today. Um, for our concerns, Donna Bartley recovering from surgery, Doris' niece, Sharon, 
and I'm going to butcher that last name because it is so strong, had a stroke and is in recovery. Sonny Wallace will be having surgery this week for an aneurysm and continued prayers for Lin Linda Wallace, also offering prayers for a safe LGBTQ month. For our joys, we have 38 kids signed up for our VBS. Barbara Wilms' daughter, 30, had a successful colon reconstruction surgery, and Maddie Jenkins will be going to volunteer at Camp Aldersgate this week. At this time, you are invited into a time of silent prayer. You can pray in your seat, by kneeling at the altar, by participating in the prayer station. You can light a candle as you offer a prayer for a loved one or ask God to guide you. Most wonderful God, who watches over us and is ever-present, we give you thanks for the special calling you've given to the United Methodist Women in Faith in our church in Arkansas, across the United Methodist Church, a calling to care for women, youth, and children. Open our hearts to the needs of women and children so that we might be responsive. Give us the opportunity to be your hands and your hearts for them in the name of Jesus Christ. Loving God, today, as we celebrate Father's Day, we lift up our fathers and those who have been fathers to us. For some of us, our father's love is like God's love, too deep, too long, too wide, too strong to measure. For others, memories of our father bring pain. Some of our dads are here. Some of them were never here. We pray for fathers who have lost their children to death, and we ask that their faith may give them hope. We pray for those in our congregation who are mourning the loss of their father on this day. We pray for those men who do not have children, but have cared for us like we were their children. Amen.
this year, our amount of women in faith supported Bologna students by providing them snack baskets for extracurricular activities, which included, all the baskets included, a note saying that we appreciate them and how they represent Bologna. Teamsters received the baskets for archery, baseball, middle school and junior high basketball, varsity basketball, bowling, cheer team, quiz bowl, soccer, softball, swim team, the track team, and the unified athletes were called Special Olympian. And I'd like to say in delivering these, any of the kids who took the baskets that I saw or the, the teachers, a lot of these teams aren't recognized publicly, so they were tickled to be offered. Um, we had the potential for 469 contacts between the students, faculty, and parent sponsors. Thank you all for supporting United Women in Faith and their Bologna store because that helps provide the funding for this. There's multiple ways you can give. You can give by check or cash, online by going to bolognaumc.org, or by using credit card machine in the back of the sanctuary. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward. Please stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our So remain standing for our final song. We'll be singing My Lighthouse, but it'll be on the screen. i 
Amen. I just have a couple of things to share. Uh, United Women in Faith members have provided a little bit of snack back here. So please stay and join us for a little bit of refreshment. And uh, a happy Father's Day to all the dads here. And remember, uh, through this, uh, not everybody grew up in a uh, uh, Father Lee's Beth house. And uh, many of us... Uh, we're blessed to find throughout life and time father figures that came to us and loved us as if we were their own. And be aware uh, that if you can be a father to someone, do so and, and, and accept their life and use, I pray. Um, uh, happy Father's Day to everyone. Uh, uh, receive this benediction, I pray. Let us depart in peace and in love and charity with our neighbors. May we be joined together in the common goal of service to our God and our communities.